Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you to worship on uh, this Sunday morning, a very special Sunday morning called Transfiguration Sunday. This is the last Sunday in our season of Epiphany before we enter the season of Lent. And it is a Sunday on which we conclude our focus on following Jesus, growth before our eyes from a uh, baby, remember Christmas, to this particular Sunday when his followers have an experience of seeing the fullness of Jesus' identity when he is seen in a mountaintop uh, with a couple of other very glorious characters from Hebrew history. That will come out during our scripture this morning. Uh, for now, uh, I want to welcome you and uh, invite you to uh, listen to some announcements before I come back with just a little bit more. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we welcome everyone here at UCC this morning. We believe that God calls us to be an un to love unconditionally. We seek to become inclusive and a respectful community for persons of every color, age, sexual orientation, gender ability, and economic means. We ask you to join us on our faith journey. Join us after worship for coffee hour and conversation in Sewell Hall. Um, today's flowers are donated by Debbie Clare in memory of Jane Raymond. Please join Ed in the conference room right after you get your coffee this morning. We will continue the conversation um, about changing world, changing church. Sorry, it's changing world, changing planet. <laughs> Shouldn't it be church? <laughs> Should be. Wednesday. already. Please join us for a short worship with ashes to be distributed at 4 p.m. If you can't make it to that worship service, you may drop by the sanctuary anytime between 4.30 and 6.30 to receive ashes. Also, Wednesday is the last day for the Bible discussion that's held here in the conference room at 10.15. All are welcome to join us. Next Sunday is Red Wagon Sunday. Please see the list of needs for our local pantry in the bulletin. Bring what you can to worship next Sunday and we will bring them forward during the children's time. Following worship next Sunday, Christian Education is showing season one of the movie, The Chosen. We hope that you will stay and watch it with us. And a reminder to send your prayer request to the Zoom host in the chat room and he will, give, he will give them to Pastor Ed to lift up during the prayer time. And please be sure to read all of the other announcements in your bulletin. Thank you. So it is changing world, changing church. Uh, but I guess changing planet fits too because we have a green team in place. And uh, they are helping us think about how we can be responsible stewards in relationship to our planet. And thanks to their work, you'll especially see some of this uh, in a calendar that will be coming to you to uh, make, mark the uh, season of Lent. So be sure and watch for that. Um, speaking of changing the seasons, this is a, a special Sunday in Epiphany. Not only is it the last, it's, uh, it's a Sunday in which you notice some changes. Uh, there are two today. One is inadvertent, or in other words, I made a mistake. Uh, and if you look to today's doxology for a moment, you'll see that it has the name of another season, Christmas Tide. And so we're singing a Christmas Tide doxology today, but that's okay because it's Transfiguration Sunday. And on Transfiguration Sunday, the church has typically focused on light, looking back both to Christmas on the one hand and Easter sunrise on the other. So as you're thinking about this today, uh, try adding this meaning and see if you can turn my mistake into something filled with worshipful meaning for you. And let me know how it goes afterwards. 
Another thing about this Sunday is it's no longer green, which is the color of Epiphany, but Transfiguration is a unique Sunday in and of itself, and the color on this Sunday turns to white in the minds of some. So I have my stole on today. This is the, one of the closest ways I can come to white, but it also has some orange in it, which reminds me of the light. And so that's why I'm dressed the way I am. This was intentional. The note in the bulletin on the doxology was not. But let's see, what do they say? If you uh, make, uh, if you uh, have lemons, you what? Lemonade. All right, so let's see if we can make some lemonade. And let's begin by settling our hearts for our worship of God. rise in body or spirit as you are able and join in the call to worship. God's divine light shines every day. Creation's needs are illuminated by divine light. Christ's light shines in the darkness. And by the Holy Spirit his light shines through us. And any darkness has neither overwhelmed nor overcome Christ's light. Our opening hymn is Praise to the Living God, number eight.
now in our opening prayer. O God of light and darkness, God of mountains and valleys, God of wherever we are and wherever we go, we worship hoping for an experience of your presence that will be transforming and energizing, ever turning us into strong holders and bright bearers of your grace-filled life. In Christ we pray. Amen. find yourselves as older children of God to be seated, and you younger children of God, I invite you to come forward and sit up here. I have a seat here. I'll move over here. So, um, what's happening at school this week? You have a big play coming up. Oh, it's February. So some of you are on vacation, and some of you are going to school this week? No. Or is your play coming up the following week? In March. So are you on school vacation this week? But you're already thinking about next month in March. Good for you. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So, um, do you like school vacations? Yeah. They're okay? Sometimes they're fun. Sometimes they can go on a little long. And how do you feel when you go back to school after a school vacation? Tired. <laughs> Sleepy? Yeah. The, 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 we call them Monday mornings after weekends or sometimes Monday mornings after a week of vacation can be hard. And sometimes, sometimes people are not only really tired, they don't really want to go back, they wish it would continue. Do you have any things you like to do you wish you could keep doing, but sometimes you have to stop doing? Any favorite things you like to do that you like to play with your dog, but sometimes you have to stop doing it to do something else? Yeah. Other kinds of things, maybe. Yeah. That's the way life is. Sometimes we can't keep doing the things we like to do. Any of you have things that you like to do, wish you could do more of? But life gets in the way? Yeah. I, uh, if, if that, this is kind of um, what happened to Jesus followers today. They went, they went up on a camp and up on a mountain with Jesus one day, and they had an incredible time there, and when the time came to leave, they didn't want to leave. Uh, but Jesus said to them, hey, let's go on, we have things to do. And uh, that's the way it is sometimes, we have things to do. Me, I'm going on vacation. I'm going a long ways away to Hawaii. Yeah, I'm lucky, except there's a, there's a twist to this story. I'm going to be flying over Utah on my way, and I really wish I could get dropped there. You know why? There's a lot of skiing out in Utah these days. A lot of snow, and I love skiing. And you do? You just went down the hill? Oh, you like to do that too, yeah, yeah. Well, I like to ski down the hill. And I really enjoy it. And a friend is um, going to Utah when I'm going to Hawaii. And so if you're jealous of me going to Hawaii, I'm jealous of my friend going to Utah. How's that for mixed up? <laughs> Except here's the footnote. I'm going to Hawaii instead of going to where I really want to be for a week, for a week. 
I'm going to Hawaii because I'm going to see a dear friend who's like a brother to me who's very ill. And so I'm, I'm choosing to go somewhere when I'd rather be somewhere else because I love my dear friend and love calls us sometimes to do things that are more important than the fun things we might like to do. And that's what today's story is all about. Well, because we're loving people, sometimes we do things for others because it's really important for us to do so rather than the things we might like to rather be doing. And that's a wonderful blessing to be that way sometimes. Life is not always about all the fun on mountaintops, but sometimes it's about being full of love and bringing love to the valleys and the low points. So, with that, we're going to continue our worship, and you're going off to Sunday school to practice your faith. But before you go, remember there's a prayer Jesus taught us. And let's, let's say that prayer together. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we'll see you after our worship and your time in Sunday school in Fellowship Hall. Let us sing. continue our worship, pausing for a moment to uh, consider where we are on our life's journey today, and maybe who or what we've thought on our hearts or in our minds as we come to worship together today. And while you think for a moment, uh, I have one name to share, the family and friends of Jack Heidbrink, who died this past week. Uh, Jack was a, a friend of uh, Lucy's family, so we keep we see in our prayers too today. Others. What do you think? I guess, you know, David had a call a week ago, mm -hmm. and uh, he was doing well. He, thought he had some put uh, staples taken out uh, of his head. He was cut his head. Those are out. Uh, all, we, all we have to do is stay with our table plenty for another week or two. But he's doing good. He's uh, back to normal. Good news. Yeah. And uh, he had a story. He, he hit his shoulder on the wall or something. <coughs> and that, that's not good. Good. So all the way around, this is a, a joy now. Yes, it was a concern. Thank yes, you for sharing that. Good. Thank you, Woody. Sally? Sally's friend Frank uh, 
She's uh, hospitalized with a number of health issues, and um, we keep Rosie as well in our prayers. Other of the news on former President Jimmy Carter, who has elected to uh, live out his life at home with hospice care. So for the, for the family of the daughter who, from Burlington, whose body was found in Wilmington this past week, we keep the family in the prayers over their tragic loss. Yeah, her name is Kaylin Rose. Kaylin. Rose. Thank you. I, I did catch it on the one evening news. Thank you. Prayers, prayers for me in a couple of weeks when I uh, leave uh, you all and fly to Hawaii. It's a, it's a beautiful place in which to uh, have a challenging time. So it's a, it's a, it's a mixed kind of blessing. And we all know we have times of mixed blessings. So, um, before we close our time together, um, Marcia, did you have a joy to share? Well, yes. Today is our own job. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody's moving to the piano. Does that mean you're turning us all into a choir? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you know it. continue our worship and since we're warmed up why don't we keep singing Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, and this is Mark's story of the transfiguration experience on the mountaintop had by some of Jesus' followers who got away with him to the top of the mountain one day. This story is 
a story that some scholars call a misplaced resurrection story. What they mean by that is, in the oral tradition, there may have been different stories that were being told about the resurrection experience based on the experiences of the first followers. And in this case, as you hear the story, you'll, you'll hear some notes that are a bit different. And it may be that Mark, as gospel author, took this story as one of the Easter story variants and placed it here for a different purpose, where it serves as a kind of foreshadowing in his story about the disciples following of Jesus and their making their way to Jerusalem. So listen for elements of the foreshadowing of Easter, as well as for who Mark is trying to say Jesus is, or at least is like. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them high up a mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This ends the reading of the scripture. Sometimes in liturgical traditions of the Christian church, the Christ candle reappears on this Transfiguration Sunday as a reminder that in spite of how far we have come through Jesus in this epiphany season, something never changed. He is the light of the world. Let us pray. O holy and gracious God, as we reflect on Jesus, our light and light for this world, grant us a gift of timely discernment that we might not only walk in the light, but we might spread it. In Christ we pray. Amen. So it's been said by a lot of folks that Life has its ups and downs, its peaks and its valleys, its darkness and its light. Surely you've experienced plenty of these elements and these poles in your life. And if I asked you where you were today, I wonder where you might say, you find yourself. 
closer to the light or closer to the darkness? At a lower elevation in the valley or at a higher elevation on the peak? Or perhaps higher up or lower down? Well, as you know, in a variation of what you will usually say, wherever you are on your life's journey, you're welcome here. This is a good place to be in the fellowship of Christ. And as for this matter of light and darkness, we have a metaphor. I remember one time a woman whose cancer had come back after a year or more of remission following her initial radiation and chemotherapy. She said, it's back. And this time, I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then I think of another man during a harder time of joblessness who'd gone through a financial crisis and finally, finally was rehired. And I remember him saying to me, so good, now I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Light and darkness, the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel, a state of well-being, one which we so especially desire to find ourselves in, especially after a trying time in a period of darkness. When relationship, when a relationship ends, illness strikes, or tragedy enters, when life just becomes hard, painful, physically or emotionally, we yearn for this proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. And when we see this light, hope arises within us, and when we experience it, it's heavenly. And we hope and pray that it will be with us eternally. That's how this is, this light at the end of the tunnel. Of light and darkness and tunnels, I remember a time of walking through a top tunnel. It was a railroad tunnel near the top of Donner Pass high in the Sierra of Northern California. Back in the day, in the 19th century, when the rail went over Donner Pass, the eastern slopes posed a challenge. They were so steep that the winter snow threatened to block the tracks quite regularly. So engineers came up with an idea. We'll design a series of snow tunnels to protect the track and to keep the trains moving. And so they did. And they built one tunnel at an elevation of over 7,000 feet. It's a third of a mile long, and it's curved. Today, it's no longer in use because they re the train tracks a number of decades ago over Don Pass. And so if you go out there today, you can hike up there, and you can walk through this tunnel, which I did one time with a friend and our kids. And so we walked up the slope side, and we walked up and around and down, and we walked to the train track on the eastern end and side of this tunnel. And the kids were all excited, you know, kids in tunnels, right? And so it was we entered this tunnel, with all of this excitement and joy in the light. But because the tunnel was curved, the further we walked into the tunnel, the darker and darker it became. And by the time we got far enough around the curve and into the middle of that tunnel, it was pitch black. 
and none of us could see our hand in front of our face. But my daughter had already started sounding off about this even before we arrived at that midpoint. Dad, it's getting darker in here. Dad, I'm scared. Dad, can I take your hand? And then the tears started. And then we were in the midpoint. And she became paralyzed. She would not move. She was so frightened. I tried to get her attention and said, Honey, let's keep moving forward. Let's go back. Honey, we, we can't go back. We have to keep moving forward. We want to go home. I want to go back. Finally, I picked her up and held her and just kept moving. And I told her to close her eyes. Kind of a silly thing, right? It didn't matter. But it helped. And finally, when I told her to open her eyes, there was the light around the curve. And when she opened her eyes, she started to settle down. And of course, when we finally reached the point where there was more light than dark, she was overjoyed. It was heavenly in that moment. Well, this is like the moment may have been for the disciples because when they went up on that mountain that day, they were in a darkening tunnel. They had left their homes, their home villages, their families and friends, everything, to follow this Jesus. And they had high hopes, and they caught some glimpses of why they'd left. They'd seen the power of his love. They'd seen some healing, as well as had some wondrous teaching. But they'd also experienced some other things, some controversy, some conflict even, with those who seemed to oppose this Jesus for some reason. And they'd even heard Jesus start to share a word that events were turning in a way that matters might come to a head soon, a head that would involve perhaps his dying. They walked with all of this up this mountain. It's a great getaway. And then when they get to the top, they have this incredible experience of two of the most revered historical leaders of the Hebrew faith. Moses, who delivered his people, and Elisha, who returned his people to ways which led them to a return to their homeland and a new temple. Jesus was in the company of these, and so their hopes were resurrected, their courage too, except not quite sufficiently for them to want to go back down. They wanted to pitch their tent and stay there forever in this peaceful, secure place. But what did Jesus say? He said, let's get going. Let's go down to Jerusalem, where we're supposed to go. Jesus was calling them to go back into the darkness so that he might bring his teaching and his love into the darkness. And so they did, and we know the rest of the story. But um, back in that darkness with my daughter, I like to think that that's what I did there for her. When she was in that moment, scared, frozen, I brought my love, and she brought her trust. And in that way, she made it through. And that's what we're called to do today to bring our light to the darkness. And I learned, um, if that's what we're called to do, I think I learned some key points in my experience with my daughter. First of all, when you're stuck in darkness, bring the belief you have in the light you cannot see. Trust, even in the darkness, that there is some light ahead. And second of all, keep your eyes focused, watching for the light ahead. Not necessarily literal light as light as you expect it. You know, it didn't matter whether my daughter had her eyes up here open or shut in that darkness. 
what matters is that she had some eyes in her heart open. Keep our eyes open, watching for the light, maybe in an unexpected way. And then, and then, until you see it, walk with someone you love and trust. That's why we're here for one another, to be people worthy of others' love and trust when they're in the darkness. That's when we bring the light to the darkness. Maybe even in moments we don't really want to experience. And that's our calling. That's our calling in life as individuals and as the church together to bring light to the darkness wherever we see it. And you know, being in the church these days, sometimes we need it for ourselves as a fellowship. We feel like sometimes we're in a tunnel with all the changes we've experienced. And so for us as a church, it's important that we remember there's light ahead on the path and the way. That's what the disciples walked with. If you remembered while Jesus was teaching about that the Son of Man must die, he also snuck in there and will be raised again. And will be raised again. And so may we be those people who trust in Jesus' word. Go back into the dark. Engage with it. Bring the light of your love there. And always keep before you this hope and trust that the light shall shine again. Maybe from a new direction. Maybe in a new kind of quality. But it will shine. May we be those people who get away but always return to our purpose. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, remembering 
of you in the beginning created the light and the dark and how you are in all that you create. We pray to you as we consider where we are in this moment in the reign of light and dark, peace and valley, easy times and tough times. Come for each of us now in the way we need, in a way that might bolster our memories and our trust. Our memories of why we are here as well as how we come to be here. Because of your creation of why we are here as a church and how we come to be here because of the experience in the faith and trust of Jesus followers and because of their courage to share good news even when under threat. And bless us, O oh gracious God, that we might carry on our mission and purpose as your church bearing your son's name. As a first step, we remember those who are in need of our thoughts and your blessings today. And so we remember those persons on our prayer list to you. For all those, especially who are in some kind of darkness, and to these we add the family of Caitlin and Jack, and for all who have experienced in recent days the death of a loved one, grant them the comfort and peace it will permit them to hope and pray to carry on. And we remember Frank and his family, and former President Jimmy Carter and his family. May they have healing, comfort, hope and peace as they face an unknown future. We praise you, O gracious God, for all the gifts of healing. In all the stories of Jesus' healing that touch the lives of those whom you heal, and bolstered the hearts and faith of those who were witnesses. And we thank you that David is on the men as our personal example. And we pray for all who are experiencing these gifts of life, not only for their lives, but for others and for those to whom these persons feel may bring light and joy. Oh, gracious God, there's so much hidden as well as seen in the darkness of this world. And so we pray for all those who have been on our minds, especially those who have been suffering from the violence that is in the weather of Mother Nature sometimes. And we pray for all of those who are cowering in the darkness that is caused by human oppression and the misuse of some political leaders. 
And we pray that as they await the bearers of the light, they will maintain a hope about the human family and trust that in the end, love will come to life. One in Christ, we pray for these, as well as all of your creation. Amen. As we consider our gifts of time and money to the work of this church, we should also keep in mind the ways in which they are transfigured. In addition to the basic needs of brick and mortar, heat and maintenance of the buildings and the programs of ministry for both youth and adults and local missions within the church, we must remember that our simple gifts can enable others to experience God's message of everlasting love. Remembering, to God's, remembering God's generosity to us, we are invited to share in this morning's offering. If you are worshiping with us on Zoom, please be reminded that you can contribute to the church online or by mail to the church office. Will the ushers please come forward?
God, receive now these gifts as signs of our offering ourselves to keep on the lookout for your light, your ways, the truth of Christ. And may we use these offerings in service of all of these. Amen. Join me in reading the commissioning. Go, having partnered in the light in the light of God. We depart with new sight and greater insight. Call to follow, call to follow Jesus, our light of the world. We shall live faithfully and boldly in light and darkness. Our closing hymn is number 182. We have come at Christ's own bidding. and in the Holy Spirit, through you and beyond you, keep you in the sight of God's glorious love and the power of its transforming peace. Amen.